Uruak, episode number 14. AfricanMusicLaw.com, your number one go to destination for celebrity legal drama, music business, and industry news. Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another exciting episode of the AfricaMusicLaw.com show. From the beautiful and sunny California, USA, it's your one and only certified game changer, Miss Uruak. I'm a fashion and entertainment lawyer with the law firm of AB2 Law Group PC here in California. The AfricaMusicLaw.com show is a show that is about the business of empowering the African artist. We don't limit it to the African artist, however. We extend it to creative talents, period, in the fashion and entertainment industry, both here in the USA and across the African continent. How do we do all of that and hopefully do it well? We do so by taking on the latest in celebrity legal drama, music business, and industry news. And we provide legal and business commentary and analysis on some of the most interesting hot topics you'll see where the pop culture collides with the law or you see pop culture just plain intersecting with the law. It's interesting. It's fun. It's entertaining. And since we can't do it all by ourselves, we also invite our industry experts, our artists, and other cool people, people we like to refer to as the AML people, so African Music Law abbreviated, to come on and share their insights with us to hopefully benefit you all. This episode is so, so exciting for me. Uh, I'm pretty excited. But before I move any further, let me tell you how you can stay in touch with us. You can subscribe on www.africanmusiclaw.com to stay updated on when we publish our weekly podcast. You can find us on iTunes. You can find us on Stitcher Radio. You can even find us on Hulkshare. And also you can even find us on YouTube. So we're getting our podcast episodes up on YouTube. So you can definitely find us also on YouTube. You can find us on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash African Music Law. You can find us on Twitter with the Twitter handle African Music Law. And of course, yours truly, the one and only certified game changer, Miss Uruak. You can find me on Twitter on my personal handle at Uruak Law. If you'd like to sponsor the show, we're on our 14th episode. Can you believe it? Some really amazing dynamic guests so far. And I promise you guys, even more interesting guests to come. So I'm really excited. And of course, um, our downtime to just speak and focus in on the law and some of the issues that affect the industry. So if you are interested in getting in front of a very unique and interesting demographic of industry heads and as well as the artists and creative talents, please feel free to hit me up for sponsorship inquiries at africanmusiclaw at gmail.com. If you also would just like to appear as a guest, show up and chat with me and spend some time with me, please hit me up at africanmusiclaw at gmail.com as well. Hey folks, what's up? How you doing? Hope all is well. August 23rd. Let me say that again. August 23rd is our third year anniversary. August 23rd. Wow. I can't even believe it. Just literally starting a blog, not much went into African Music Law on on like my other websites and stuff with business plans and all this extensive stuff. I was just like, look, I need to be communicating with you guys and just started it and moved on with it. It it wasn't even, I wasn't even thinking that much because I was blogging very extensively at fashionentlaw.com and I noticed that the few articles I wrote about the African industry, people were so interested. And then as the blog website talks about trying to combine all my different interests and most importantly, have it serve uh, and focus in on women and children on the continent, I was I literally didn't think that much to launch the blog and I can't believe it. We're three years old now. How fantastic and amazing. Here's what I'd like to do. 
and we'll provide more information on the website. I'd like to spend some quality time with you guys. That's what I'd like to do. For me personally, if you get to know me and know me very, very well, you know that I really value downtime with my friends and family. There's nothing as beautiful since I was in grade school up till now, just sitting literally one-on-one time with my friends and we can stay hours just talking about anything, you know, debating, arguing, or quality time, just listening to music, reading. It doesn't really matter. Like, it doesn't really matter what we do. We're just hanging out together. So I really enjoy my downtime with my friends and family. It's really important to me. And I'd like to extend that to you guys because you are part of my family now. Three years, a lot of you following my work and and. I was just on uh, social media recently when one of the um, when I saw a tweet from a AML listener saying that he has all episodes and he listens and he can listen on his downtime. I should have pulled up his handle for this this episode. But anyways, shout out to you guys and that listener and all of you that that listen and and follow what I'm doing and our guests coming on here. We are going to be three years old on August 23rd. And there's no better way for me to spend it and have immense pleasure doing so than to spend it with you guys. So I'm thinking of a webinar that will allow me to answer any and all questions you may have. Possibly Google Hangout if we don't do the regular webinar um, route. But I really would prefer a webinar possibly because Google Hangout, I've used it in the past, a little bit of glitches and it was just like, ugh. But I'm open to it. So tell me what you guys think. I'm going to drop um, a podcast. I mean, I'm going to drop a post just exclusively about that, about some downtime. I want to answer all your questions, anything you may have, any questions you may have covering legal uh, drama, music business, or industry news, and questions you might specifically have for your specific situations in terms of just general information that you're trying to inquire. If it's something that requires... Um, more, you know, retaining legal counsel. Certainly, I'll be, I would be glad to refer you guys um, to my firm during regular business hours to talk a bit more about that. For the time being, for our celebration, I just would like to spend some time with you guys. So think about it, and we'll we'll go from there. All right, all right, all right. Oh, all right, all right, all right. Like, is that how he says it? Matthew McConaughey. I love him. I think he's the sexiest person ever on earth. Like, I just absolutely adore him. Like, think he's so, so good looking. Hot guy and can act up a storm. So anyways, I think he says, all right, all right, all right. So let's get started with our special guest for today. He is so interesting. I love talking to him. He's phenomenal. You know, they're phenomenal women and then they're phenomenal men. I think this man is phenomenal. I think what he's been able to do in Hollywood's industry as a Hollywood director of African heritage is impressive. I don't understand why I don't seem as part of the important dialogues that need to be taking place, partly probably because he's too busy making a lot of things happen. But I think that it's essential that we bridge the gap between the U.S. as well as Africa. And I keep sitting here looking at the history of Nollywood, looking at the fact that it's now a second largest producing industry in the world when it comes to film. And then looking at the fact that for seven consecutive years, I've been covering Nollywood and interviewing all kinds of people within the industry. And then, of course, in the back end, before I even got to start doing the more journalistic work, organizing events uh, for Nollywood-related Um, issues and and just talking about the film industry as a whole. And when I look at it and I hear certain things like distribution, 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 I'm like, can I just scream about this? We have people, our own people doing this already. Why aren't we taking advantage and having a dialogue and asking how exactly this process is done? Why do we keep going to outsiders? Or even if we don't go to outsiders, we just spend too much more time talking about distribution problem, but not going to people who actually have solutions and are solving the distribution problem. We are intelligent people. To tell me that Americans and every other group, uh, yes, I am American also, but to tell me that other groups, all the people in the West, And even, you know, in South Africa and other areas of of the world can figure out distribution. But Nollywood, then people will make the actual movie. They know if figure out distribution, waiting. It's not that complicated. 
It really isn't. And too much talk, 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 no solution. So I invited someone who's going to do the solution, who's solution oriented, who leaves this life practically. So it's not theory or whatever where you sit in class and take notes. This is actual real deal. The man is doing it. I walked into Blockbuster in the past when Blockbuster was still open. I went in, I saw his movies, I rented them, I watched them, I enjoyed them. So I know it can be done and I know he's everywhere. His distribution is everywhere. So folks, for my filmmakers, AML filmmakers, yes, do take notes. You do need to take notes. Everybody else listening, take notes. You do need to take notes and no too much intellectualism or what I call, you know, intellectual masturbation where it's like too much of everything is bad. You can't spend too much time in the head. You don't see the practical street like this is how it works. We'll take a break. We'll come back. And when we come back, you'll meet one of my buddies, somebody I really enjoy talking to and spending time with when it comes to the business of film. And I will leave his name out. You'll you meet him and I, I get to introduce him after this break. We'll be right back. You'll listen to the AfricanMusicLaw.com show with your one and only certified game changer, Miss Uduak. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to the AfricanMusicLaw.com show with Miss Uruak. I told you about this phenomenal guest. I always enjoy when I talk to him. I can talk to him forever. And you're going to see why in a second. Allow me to introduce to you the one and only film director, none like him, Mr. Pascal Atumo. Pascal, how are you? I'm fine. How are you doing, my sister? I'm doing great. I'm doing really good. It's so good. It's so, so good to hear your voice. Nice to speak with you as always. You've been traveling all over the place. Give us an idea. You were in Brazil <laughs> and then you just got back. Yeah, I went, you went, traveled everywhere. Yeah, yeah, I went to Brazil to support the Super Eagles. So we traveled with them for all their matches. Uh, we did uh, Curitiba, Cueva, Porto Alegre, Brazil. Uh, How do you take see the Eagles now? Were you happy with the results? Uh, not at all, not at all, uh, not at all. But 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 I'm, I wasn't that disappointed uh, mm -hmm. because that game against Argentina showed what we can do if we really get it together. Yeah. So I was yeah I wasn't that disappointed. We have the talent. You and know we have talent. We do, we do. Yeah. And the, the whole FIFA ban too. I wasn't really getting why we got into that situation. Supposedly with the government. Did, can you explain that a bit? Yeah, what happened is that uh, FIFA doesn't want the governments to interfere with sp uh, football operations mm -hmm. in any nation. So uh, when we lost that game that day, uh, where well, the ambassador of Nigeria and Brazil, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, what's his name again? I'm forgetting his name. Something, Mr. Mezozo, right? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I can so, hear you quite well. So he invited everybody to his residence for dinner that was where Keshi resigned and do, after that that night we knew that was going to be a problem because the uh the nfa officials none of them came to that party ah yeah they didn't show up to that dinner so um the next day when they I, i'm gonna say since we are we are on they abandoned the players at the hotel ah no, that wow. day after they lost the next day you were on your own because a couple of them i'm not going to mention the number one of them you know, because they don't take, uh, they didn't refuse to take dollar, which is something somebody's supposed to do for them. I use my credit card to check him in. Wow. Yeah, and then uh, he gave me, he gave me the money in cash. So they, they shouldn't be put through all those kind of things because they lost their match. Yeah, and they can't uh, even so, concentrate on their games or yeah, have the right mindset. <laughs> yeah. So when they got back to Nigeria, the officials got back to Nigeria. I had one of them was put under house arrest or something. Oh. Yeah, yeah, and then FIFA didn't like that. FIFA said they must be reinstalled yeah, and then put on suspension. And then they had a meeting. The NFA had a meeting where they anointed, uh, you know, what they call it, the Emergency Committee, Emergency Management Team, or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, care, the caretaker committee. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and FIFA refused to uh, recognize those. You wow. know, so that's why that's why the ban came along. 
Mm. If, if, if it wasn't because it's Nigeria, it would happen to any other. If it was any other nation, they would, people would still do the same thing. Still do the same thing. Oh, yeah, it's, it's part of the rules. Yeah, part of the rules and regulations. Well, thank you for the insight. I know you're always on point, and we're about to just really dive into into Nollywood and Hollywood like no other. AML listeners, let me tell you something that I really like about Pascal. First of all, I think that we have such an amazing talent and a man with a lot of experience and industry experience, but no one seems to be talking to him. I don't understand why, as an industry, we go to everybody else but the people in front of us who have the experience and who really understand both continents or, or both sides of the aisle or both sides of the pond and can really serve as a bridge. So again, I'm delighted to have Mr. Pascal Otumo on the show. And Pascal, let's get right into it. Okay. I'm going to cover everything. But let's start first with how you got your big break in Hollywood and the very first movie that you did. Please flow, because I want to hear all of that, and I'm sure my audience also wants to hear that. Yeah, you know, I studied theater at Kim Dawson College in Dallas, Texas. So after graduation, I moved down to uh, Hollywood. And uh, when I first came into Hollywood, it was difficult to break in here because they always say, oh, you have an accent, you have an accent, you have an accent. You know, so luckily for me, one day I went to an audition at UCLA. It was a UCLA... Uh, a postgraduate student who was uh, doing a, a project for, for his classes. I think it was something that so he was doing. So he casted me in a movie to play an African prince. Then after that, what the girl that played my wife in that movie now referred me to another director who now casted me in another short film. But after that short film, it was difficult. The short film was called uh, In His Case. And then the one I did for the USA guy was called Accidental Life. Um, after that, it was difficult to get roles. Every time my agent sent me, they so Pascal, we like you, but, you know, your accent is a problem. So I decided to go and find a way to write my own scripts. So I went to, um, you know, you know Michael Ajakwe, right? Michael of course, Ajakwe. of course. Mm -hmm. I interviewed him a long time ago. Yeah, so I went to Michael and I told Mike, you know what, I don't think I'll make it here in Hollywood if I keep waiting for people to give me roles. Can you, can you write a story for me? So I have a story, which was only in America, my first film. Then Mike said, no, I can't write it for you. You can write it. <laughs> you write it yourself. <laughs> I said, but I don't know how to write it. He, uh, he went and brought a copy of uh, the TV show Eve. You know the Eve show? Yes, because I know he's written a lot of shows, including Moesha. And I think he wrote a part of Eve at some point, right? He was a prominent writer on, uh, on Eve. Okay. So he gave me one episode. He said, you know, you go read this. You started the format, and you, you throw your story like that. If it's not good enough, I'll help you. Right? So I took it. When I took that script, and left that place, and I went, and then I started following what he showed me. Because, you know, he's a professional writer. Yeah, so I followed everything he showed me, and I wrote the first script. I didn't send it first to him. I sent it first to the director that had me, directed me in, in that movie, in his case, to see if he would like it or not. The guy's name is David Ducroyne. David read and said, yes, Pascal, I like it. I said, okay, if you like it, do you like it enough to direct it? Mm, mm hmm mm-hmm, yeah. mm-hmm. Because you didn't want that, you know, don't give me the crap or the runaround. Will you direct this kind of movie? Yeah, well, so if you say you like it, man, that means it's good, right? Can you direct it? Can you put your name on it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yes, 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 I, I can direct it, but where do, you, where do you plan on raising the money? Then I told him, I said, I used to be a businessman in Dallas, Texas, and uh, I have a lot of you know, business contacts in Dallas. I can take the production to Dallas and I can raise the money. And he said, oh, well, if you raise the money, then I'll come direct it. Well, hold on a sec. At the time you said that in your mind, because I've heard a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of business people say, you know, they say, okay, I'm going to raise the money. But in their head, they're thinking, I have no clue how I'm going to do that. Did you have a little bit of fear or you knew for sure that the people in Dallas are going to support you and you were able to raise that money? Or was it just fate? I, it, honestly, it was fate, and uh, another thing is, by God's grace, my sister, if I tell you I'm going to do something, it's going to be done, one way or the other, by God's grace. You know, so well, you just to put your heart into it and to speak it. Like, if you listen to Joe Austin, do you yeah, listen Joe to Joe Austin, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, I like um, Joyce Meyer, but yes, about the same thing, about speaking things that you want into existence. existence. Yeah, it, it speak your future. You have to speak, speak your future. That's how he said it. So, you know, but I, I knew that when we get to Dallas, one word or the other, the film will be made. Okay. Once we get to Dallas. So you tell my job, this man. My only, uh, 
my only challenge was to convince him to come with his crew to Dallas oh, without okay. the money sitting on the floor. Mm -hmm. So you're telling us here the challenge then was to convince this director on yeah. how to get his crew yeah. to Houston Dallas. or Dallas. Sorry. Dallas. So how did that happen? Did that ever happen? Yeah, it did. It did happen. Uh, he assembled a crew of eight people. Then we did audition here. We got go. I needed us to have the lead from Los Angeles. So we, we, we did audition, he conducted the audition, and we got uh, Tangerine Martin. Uh, so when Tangerine Martin agreed to go now with nine people, then uh, with my brother Oscar, I told my brother we need to get a hotel for nine people for three weeks, 21 days, we need to get wow. flights. My brother said, how, how, you, how you planning to do that? So we need to start one by one. <laughs> <laughs> so luckily for us, uh, I went to Dallas, I flew to Dallas first, and I met a couple of people that we used to do business together before and uh, they said Pascal if you believe this is gonna work then we'll do it so they got together we raised the money while I was sitting down there in Dallas within two months I sat, I was in Dallas for two months mm. then within two months we raised enough money to bring them in and then we when we started shooting we ran out of money on the 15th day Wow then we ran out of money then I I spoke to David. I said, David, do you like what we've shot so far? He said, yes. I said, why don't you give me back the money I paid you? <laughs> yeah. He's, He's like Niger man. <laughs> yeah, it's a true story. I said, give me back the money I paid you. Let's use that money and pay the rest of the crew to finish. And we mm -hmm. split the film. And we split the film 50-50. Mm -hmm. So you offered him more of an equity stake yeah. in the film. Yeah. Yeah, I said, you say you like it? He said, yes. And you know we can get distribution. He said, yes. It's a good film. I like the story. It's going. I said, okay, David, um, give, me, give me back the money I paid you. <laughs> can you imagine? Yeah. And I said, you give it back to me. You take 50% of the film. He said, are you sure you want to give up? I said, David, I swear to God. He said, I give it up or we lose the film. So he said, let him talk to his wife. That should give him like an hour. After an hour, he knocked on my, uh, he knocked on my, uh, he knocked, uh, and I opened up my room, and he said, "Yeah, we can do it. Let's sign the paperwork." So we did the paperwork. So he brought out his credit card. We went to the bank and we bought uh, cashier's check and paid everybody off, and we finished. Wow, that's a miracle yeah. right there. Yeah, he was nice. That they was a so miracle. Good. Yeah, even when we came back to LA, I didn't have money to pay my rent, so he 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 had another meeting with his wife and they advanced me five thousand dollars wow that that wow. would take after this so trip. what year is this this was in 2003 wow so here yeah, 2003, first, 2004, yeah. a couple of things for all filmmakers listening to this aml filmmakers because this is inspiring you've just got to have something inside of you that just keeps going Pascal, yeah. where's that hunger coming from? Because it's not just you, a lot of Africans, because I've heard this over and over again, even in my legal profession, I've heard people tell me they don't want to go into practicing law because of their accent. People are turning you down, saying there's a problem with your accent. You're great. You're, you're awesome. They love you. But ah, yeah. Biko, the accent. Where did you yeah. find that confidence? Um, you know, the way we were raised, I, I, I attended Government College Omaha. I don't know if you heard about Government College Omaha. Before. I know Omaha, but I don't know Government College. Government College Omaha is one of the premier uh, schools in the Eastern region. Mm -hmm. You can survive that school for five years. You can survive anywhere in the world. I can boldly say. Wow. You look at the last past governors of Abia State, the last three or four of them that have been products of Government College Omaha. Mm -hmm. So we were trying to figure out a way. You have to find a way. You can't let anybody stop you. So I felt like if I keep sitting down in Hollywood looking for roles, right, I'm going to be sitting down for a long time. So that's why I took up the challenge. And uh, by God's grace, you know, the, the, the what good was thing the about, movie? What was the movie? It's called Only in America. Only in America. Okay. Yeah. All right. We got, we got lucky. Made after he finished that film, we sold it to Mavericks Entertainment. Mm -hmm. So he was sold in Blockbuster, Walmart, Netflix. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Okay, and then we, at the time, because I don't remember that movie uh, in terms of what made me really know about you, but I do remember The American Nurse, Hurricane in the Rose Ga Garden, and a bunch of other ones that came after. And of course, your, your latest um, movie that we're going to talk about, LAPD Cops, which is LAPD African Cops, which is absolutely very funny, uh, at least the trailer so far. So let's still stay on that note. 
This is your first movie. Now it's distributed in major retail stores in the U.S. How did that make you feel? Um, you know, I, I knew God was with me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> was, I knew I was going to succeed. All I, all I needed was to put up effort. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know I, I was convinced God was going to be there. So what happened is that what I'm going to advise the young filmmakers, don't set out to do the film. But when you set out to do the film, go to any length to finish it. Because mm-hmm. if you fell with the first one, it's going to take you a long time to try it again. Well, you mentioned also a lot of people sitting around for roles. That's the story and being the history of a lot of black filmmakers and then the African filmmakers that come here. Let me ask you a question. We'll get to Nollywood some more later on. But I see a pattern with our filmmakers um, and not even filmmakers, our talents coming to the U.S. and sitting down there and sitting down there and sitting down there for people to give them roles not taking a hold of the narrative. And then someone like you shows up or someone like Stephanie or a few others, and they just come, they make their movie, and they go. They don't really care what anyone thinks or says. What is your advice to particular African talent? Because I get tired of seeing that routine, just sitting there and waiting. Yeah, you know, the thing is this. I'm not going to mention names. I've had a lot of African talents that I've told them, my brother, you know, my sister, if you keep sitting here, you'll be sitting here for a long time. Now. Because... Um, you can't just sit here and wait for them to cook the food for you to eat. <laughs> it's so you, true. Yeah, if you look at the... Uh, um, no disrespect to actors, right? If you come into the chain of what we do, the chain of power in our business, right? Actors are the, at the very low, the bottom. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, on the food chain, they're at the bottom. The yeah. In Hollywood. Now, if you look at it... If you look at it and you decide that you want to stay at the bottom, that's your business. You're going to be there for a long time. Because before they share, distribute the thing and it gets to you, it might be gone. That's why they're able to tell you, I want you, I don't want you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. But if you can find your way into writing, if you can act, that means you have some kind of talent. Talent, writing is talent too. Right, you can collaborate with people. You can get, I'm sure, if you have five friends, one of them must be talented in writing. You guys get together, write your stuff, you know, find a way. What, ha- what I find the, the, the thing I see that is the hindrance to most people here a lot of people don't want to sacrifice, they don't want to suffer, they, they don't want to take risk. Okay, the, hold on a sec want- before you talk about people taking risk. Maybe we're jumping too fast. Why don't you explain to people, a lot of people that are going to listen to this across the globe and also here, how does Hollywood really work? You know, big picture from point A to point Z. How does the Hollywood film uh, ecosystem really work? How does it work? Uh, It's a big game. It's a big game that cannot be explained. There's no particular formula, right? But the simplest formula is to come in here as an actor, get your headshots done, Look for an agent. Don't look for the big agents because if you go with the big agents, they're not going to send you out because they have their big clients. They need to send out first, right? Mm-hmm. Look for a small agency that can believe in your talent and send you out there. And then from there, you work your way up. You know, you take uh, seminars, you take classes, yeah, you study the environment, you mingle. Uh, so that way, you get to know the people and then try to find the people who are here to stay, not the visitors. Okay, so this is the actor or actress path. What about the filmmaker, like yourself, a director? Because I know you act also. Now what about the filmmaker route? How do you break into Hollywood? What's the, how does the big system look, the big picture? The, the filmmaker route is uh, it's a more difficult system. You cannot be a filmmaker without sacrifice. You have to be ready to give give it all. Okay, what does that mean in English? In English, what that means to give it all is... Uh, I don't know how to explain it so that you can just understand it in a heartbeat. Yeah, okay. well, the best you can explain. Because a lot of people are hungry for this information and they don't know. They just show up and do what they think they're supposed to be doing. And then they end up, you know, broken. Lots of broken people walking around in Hollywood. I see them, you see them. So I'm just trying to get an overview of, of how the system really works in a simple English way from someone who does it on a daily basis. The best way I can explain it is this. If you don't want to, if you're afraid of blood, 
If you are afraid of getting injury, if you are afraid of death, don't join the military. <laughs> that's that's the uh, <laughs> planet. You 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 for you to survive here, number one, be a filmmaker here. You have to have talent. You have to have talent. You have to have training. Then after you have talent and training, you have to become a businessman. Or right? woman. You have, or, or woman. You have to match the passion with the business. If they don't match, you're not going anywhere. Because the people that, that, that will bring the money, they are not interested in film. They're only interested in putting in one dollar and making two dollars. Mm-hmm. Investor, VC, venture capitalist, just very focused on their bottom line. And so you are interested in making good movie. You are interested in making funny movie. That's your business. That's not their business. The only meeting they have with you is this. My brother, if I put this 50000 or 100000 here, are we going to get 120 130 back? How long are we going to get this money back? Da, 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 da. That's all they're interested in. So it's left for you to make sure that you step up a little close to their own thinking. Mm-hmm. Because if you your own thinking of passion, 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 my sister, you're going to be passionate for a long time. Okay, so my brother, let's talk about this bottom line uh, numbers. We saw big movies like Half a Yellow Sun come out of Nigeria. I hear the ban has been lifted and going to be everywhere nationwide. So we heard that, right? So the ban has been lifted. The movie is now going to be everywhere nationwide. But they spent millions of investment dollars in that particular film. And then there was the Black November that uh, Jeta Mata said he was doing some years back that I in- interviewed Mbonga Mata and Jeta Mata. Till now, we haven't seen that. And I know lots and lots of money have been spent. Then there was Tony Abulu, who also spent some money, uh, some of the funding that came from the Nigeria Designated Fund for Filmmakers. And I think, there was, I forget the name of the movie, it had a doctor in it and had some, you know, some, some names, Isaiah Washington, and a, you know, a couple of other names in it. A lot of this, no return on investment. I mean, Half a Yellow Sun might argue differently because they're still, you know, they just recently debuted. But what would you say to filmmakers about your investors are looking for return on investment. Is it smart to be spending all these millions and there's no real return? Okay, the problem is this, right? Well, you know, I'm going to shoot straight because I don't, nobody, nobody's feeding me. I'm going to shoot straight. Okay. The, pro- the problem is, it's like this. You go to a high school, right? Mm-hmm. Someone in class one or JS1, he comes first in his class, right? Because he came first in his class, you jump him from JS1 to SS3 without him studying what is in JS2, studying what is in JS3, passing JS3, going to SS1, SS2. You jump the person because they came first in their class, their little class one. You jump them to class six. And then when you get them to class six, you give them this big physics textbook, the best physics textbook. You give them the best chemistry textbook, and you just say, okay, go, study it and pass. And they don't know what to do with it because they, you know. They, they, they're going to study it, all right, right? They're going to look at that book, all right? But they're not, they're, they're not trained, right, to know what is in that book here. Because for you to go from JS1 to SS3, you, it's a process, right? So the reason why those movies you mentioned are not making money is because those guys were giving money that they don't know that give them to come and play in a city, in a field, in a place that they don't have idea how it runs. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. You, you can't just pick up. A lot of people call me, they say, Pascal, oh, I know you have distribution with uh, Cinedyne. I know Lions get just picked up on things. I know you're done with Mavericks. How do you get distribution? No. You need to come in here. Before even you make the movie, before the movie is made, you need to have meeting with the distribution companies. They need to read that straight. But who is but who is the one saying no no no? Are the distribution companies saying no, or are you going to the distribution companies and still able to make headway? You know, remember well, you said I started and there was a lot of rejection, so I went and did my own thing. And yes, I got distribution down the line. But are distribution companies also saying no because they're not used to Africans in that space? No, no, they're not saying no because of that. You can tell an African all these stories. I'm telling they're all African stories, right? Yes, but true. I'm, what? They need to come in here and get trained. They need to come in here and study what people here want to see. Do you understand what I'm saying? They need to come in here, and if you want to tell an African story, like the last king of Scotland, right? Yes. You need to bring that in here 
get get the professionals who know what it's all about. They, they let them analyze. I'll give you an example. There was a movie that was brought to me called uh, The Feet of Destiny, mm. right? Okay, that will explain to you. That movie was a story about the culture, Austin JJ, JJ culture. Oh, yeah, yeah. To me to produce. I looked at it. I asked the guy that brought it to me, how much money do you guys want to spend? He said three million. I said three million naira or US dollars. They said three million US dollars. I don't know where they were getting the money from, right? My the all they wanted me to come in was to come and run the show, right? I told the guy, I said, after reading this script, that this script is not worth more than three hundred thousand dollars investment. Mm. They have three million, right? I'm supposed to come in and make money because I'm supposed to make ten percent of that money. Yeah. That's what it put. But I told them that this script I'm having in my hand is not worth three hundred thousand US dollars. You know what they told me? What? They said, Pascal, my brother, forget that and just collect your own money and do what we ask you to do. I said, No, I'm not gonna put my name on it. Mm. Mm-hmm. 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 Why did why was it why was it important to you? Why weren't you focused on, hey, you're gonna get paid? You know, yes, well, I knew that if you throw three million into that movie. Till the day Jesus Christ will come, you will not recover more than five. <laughs> there is this. America mm-hmm. is not a soccer nation. America is now just picking up soccer, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They did a movie called Bend It Like Beckham. Yes, I remember that. The Indian uh, girl. Well, you that did, was in it. They did Bend It Like Beckham and they didn't make money. Okocha is popular. Is Okocha more popular than Beckham? That's true. You know? That's true. That's true. No more popular than Beckham. Yeah. Well, Kocha is in Europe. He never played in the U.S. That's true. How many people in the U.S. know of someone called Austin J.J. Kocha? Now, true talk, oh, my brother. Africans, right? Mm-hmm. And maybe Europeans who have watched him in Germany, watched him in London. Now, another question is this. You are trying to bring a culture and then the story that is soccer to a country like America and spend $3 million. Who's going to buy the film? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. It, Put my name on it. I already know it's, I'm go- we are going to fail. Why go- Why join you and fail with you? <laughs> God. <laughs> okay, so let me ask you a question. It's interesting. Through it all, you have stayed in LA and so far mm. and get your movies out. A lot of uh, other African filmmakers have seen the evolution and revolution happening on the continent and they have moved back to the continent and they're they're seeing a a return on investment they're making films that are winning awards whether at ama or all those other awards across the continent why did you decide to remain in la i i if i when i went to theater school in dallas and spent those two years in a classroom i didn't spend it to go and compete in africa that's not why I spent those two years in the classroom. I spent those two years to come and compete in Hollywood. So before I even went to school, I knew I knew where I wanted to go to, and I knew what I was looking for. And um, uh, that's why, if you notice, I'm not into the award award things that they do. I don't. I only actually support on one or two awards that I go to. Well, I it's as simple as submitting your work, right? Why don't you submit your work for them to consider for this awards? As simple as that. Not as simple as that. Um, uh, if I am scared of nobody. If you have money, you win any award you want. Simple and short. And I'm not into that. I'm not into that. I'm into merit. If it's not by merit, I don't want it. So, uh, all right. So you've answered why you are deciding to stay in Los Angeles and and, re- and what you went to school for a specific purpose. Let me take it a different direction and then we'll ultimately get to all these wonderful films you're doing and the whole process of storytelling. You mentioned Umahia. Am I saying it correctly, Umahia? I call it Umahia, yes. Okay. And I know that uh, some of the political happenings and vigilante justice and all this craziness and students, you know, being killed while they're in their schools have really affected you. And I know if I remember you putting something on Facebook about one of the schools you attended. Could you tell us a bit more about that experience just generally in terms of attending school there and how that affected you and, and maybe what you're thinking as a filmmaker you want to do? Um, it was when I was in engineering school in the University of Port Harcourt. And uh, there was a student riot uh, because we didn't have uh, power, we didn't have water, and uh, the toilets were overflowing. And then wow. the students felt that the school didn't care. 
and then we you know we put up a little bit of uh, uh, you know protest and uh, they sent police in to you know to evacuate the school and the police came they didn't play as if we were students they played as if we were people that they were fighting and they ended up you know there was two students or one I for sure one I know Ebenezer was killed was shot and killed yeah, and I had somebody else was sh shot in the other campus because we have Ochoba, Abuja, and Mandela. So uh, Ebenezer was with us in Choba campus. So it was in Choba that he was shot. So after that, you know, I never, I never felt happy about it up to today. So when I heard about that, Alu, the Alu, Alu, the Kili, Alu four, yeah, the Alu four, it, it struck a chord. Like you know, it brought back bad memories. So that's why I wrote what I wrote on Facebook. And uh, the, the movie will be made one day soon. Amen, it's amen. Amen, so because we do need to tell those kinds of stories and hopefully use African cinema to change the mindset of our people um, in terms of them taking matters and the law into their hands. Okay, the other sort of touchy subject I wanted to talk about before we get back to the, the business of film is I know that at some point your mother, you lost your mother, correct? Yeah, yeah, my mom has been dead, yes. When was this? Oh, three years ago. Okay, my sympathies again. I know I'd extended it before, but I just want to do that again. Tell us the kind of mother you, you had, especially for a very strong man like you. I'm sure she was uh, quite a force to be reckoned with. Tell us a little bit about her. Yeah, my mom was a gospel lady, choir mistress. She was a choir mistress for 38 years. So growing up in our house, you have to go to church. That's it. Mandatory. You have to be. <laughs> if you don't, you can't lie. Oh, I can't come to the choir today because my mom sent me somewhere. Your mom is the choir mistress. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, How many were you guys, or are you guys? Seven of us. Seven. Okay, and all seven still in Nigeria, or some are everywhere. Oh well, you got Oscar here too. Of course, are here. How many? Six. Okay, six of you yeah. guys are here in the U.S. In the U.S. Yes. Wow, that's great. You have your siblings. Awesome. And then only one left over there now. She's married to some guy that don't want anything to do with the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so your mom was, everybody had to come to, to, to choir or to church, church lady for sure. And then what else about your mom would you like to share with us? Midwife. You know, she was a midwife. So oh, very nice. Most of the people from my brother's age down majority of them she delivered them wow we have something in common my maternal grandmother great grandmother was uh, a midwife and delivered uh, practically all the babies in the village according to my uh, family my mom's side of the family the history that they they've passed down so great yeah so in my, in my village they only know my mom as mommy everybody calls her mommy including the women call her mommy because mm, she delivered all their babies, wow, or practically yeah. all the babies in the in the village. The kids were having problem, right? And then she shows up. She says, "Look at this small one. Look at this small <laughs> one." Like a rat. She, he came out. <laughs> wow. So, so she she had that kind of influence, and uh, she devoted her life to helping people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What was it about filmmaking that attracted you? That made you even go to Dallas in the first place to study film? Mm, right from when I was in high school in government college Omar here, mm -hmm. my high school teacher told my dad that that's where I belonged. But my father, you know, African parents, wow. they want to be a medical doctor, they want to be an engineer, they want to be a lawyer, that's all that matters. Right? So my dad didn't pay attention. They sent me to Federal Polytechnic of Wana I did a medical lab tech there. Uh, science lab tech there. Then I went to do my IT industrial training at uh, Queen Elizabeth Specialist Hospital. And I couldn't deal with the specimen, these the stool samples and urine samples. After dealing with that, I can eat when I go home. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that this, you, you guys dream is for me to be a medical doctor, but how can I be a medical doctor when after walking this small walk of three months, I can't eat anymore? Because every time. <laughs> Eat, I will see these two samples sitting down like the food. Oh, that's terrible, man. Yes. You have a very creative mind. I have that kind of mind, too. So, yes. I understand. Yes, so I refused to do that. Then from there, they sent me to engineering school. I, You know, when I was in engineering school, I think I was just studying it for them because I never enjoyed it for a day. Mm. I got to do what I said. Oh, freedom at last. 
<laughs> then and I decided to go back to school because every time I keep hearing my teacher's voice in my head. Yeah, that teacher was so insightful because I mean, yeah, I keep hearing way Mr. behind, way ahead of. Was it a woman or a man? Man, Mr. Obi. Yeah, Actually, Mr. Was too. yeah, Mr. Mr. Obi was way ahead of his, his his way ahead of his time because to to know that you were best in theater arts and acting that's that's amazing. I was the chief speaker of the Benin Society at Government College of Maya for three years, you know, and he told them, he told them they didn't want to hear it, you know, but uh, thank God for America, <laughs> freedom <laughs> and love, right? So when I came to America, I came to America, so I decided to go back to school, and my dad said, for sure, I said, but I have to, and you know, the first day I got to school, and when I enrolled, that was when, you know, how you feel at home? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Me, all of a sudden, I like school. Yeah. I, but all of a sudden, I like school. I want to go to school, you know. But um, as God will have it, destiny destiny prevailed, and I'm I'm happy with what I do. I'm very very happy. I feel privileged. Okay. But, yeah, a lot of people will live in this lifetime, and they will never get a chance to do what they love doing for a living. Unfortunately, because they don't follow that voice in their calling. But yes, um, that's great that you came into that and totally said this is what I'm meant to do. Okay, so let's now talk about what you're meant to do and what you're doing. What The blockbuster movie I think that a lot of people still recognize you for is The American Nurse. Tell us about that film, the synopsis of what it was about and the process and what went into making it. Okay, my American Nurse is actually a story because when we came into America, we saw a lot of uh, families. You go to like African parties. Mm-hmm. See a couple, they have on the same uniform. They have the same thing like husband and wife. But you read their you read their chemistry. They look like enemies, Mac Tyson and uh, Holyfield. <laughs> to get the only thing combining them, attaching them as husband and wife, just the the outfit, right? You know how you see people holding their wife's hand and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you don't see it. But that isn't that a cultural thing though? Because back home, that's starting to change with that generation. But much older generation, they didn't they didn't hold hands, they didn't kiss in public. I think the entertainment industry has changed a lot of that. But that's not, you know. I don't recall yeah. back growing up over there where people were touching like that or even kissing stuff. In yeah, it did happen like that back home, but there was something they did to show love. This one's here, right? If you read into them, you can see. Then I started, because I used to host a lot of shows, right? Mm-hmm. I used to travel. So I started asking questions like, ah, this man, sometimes you see a guy, a man about 60 years old, right? You look at the wife. The wife is a pretty, pretty 26-year-old girl. Wow. And they have their two kids going, and one man, how did this man, you know, I have a very, a very dangerous mind. I said, how did this man catch this girl? Mm-hmm. Then I will start asking questions. Then I'll find out that, oh, this man has gone home, asked them to put this girl in nursing school, or, you know, or some cases they have brought this girl here, sent them to nursing school, and the girls are walking, and then the guys are no longer walking. They just, they'll be taking the money and go home and building houses and taking chieftaincy titles, and then they'll be forcing the girls to, you know, you have to work. Some of the girls work 14-hour days, 16-hour days. When they finally get hold of American culture, they'll be divorced. Some of them have killed you. You've had to do something. I some know, people. so terrible stories, yeah. it's yeah. So after all that, I decided, I said, you know what? And I really need to make this picture so that, number one, my main goal of making the picture was to show the parents at home, the families at home, right? Mm-hmm. Don't force your marry anybody because they just came from America. Yeah. And at the same time, to, to show the people, the, the guys here, that it's happening, and we all know it's happening. You may not believe it's happening, but look at the picture. Is this not your life? Is this not the life you're living? Right? And then you, you have the case of some of the nurses who themselves, they, they think now they're better than their husbands. They don't want their husband. They want a younger guy, right? Even though the man still loves them, the man is still doing nice, or the man is still taking care of them, but once they feel like, oh, I can take care of myself now, they kick the man out, they divorce the guy. So that's what the story of America is all about. So I decided to put it in film. But I didn't want to write it as a serious film. Uh, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, yes. That's, that's, I think, one of the things that really makes you stand out. A lot of your movies tend to have a very comical um, angle to it. Yeah, so, but it's because that, the story of American is a very serious story that could have been done like a crime drama, drama, pure dirty drama, right? Yeah. But I, if I do like that, people may not want to watch it. 
So the best thing for me to do, let me do it in a comedic form so that they'll be laughing and laughing and laughing throughout the film. So when the film ends, when they lay down and close their eyes, they'll play back and say, wow, that was not really funny. That was not really funny. Actually, yeah. That's what I did with American Mass. And I have to ask you, where do you get your sense of humor? Because your, your writings and what you make come to life are always so funny. But yet, when, when one talks to you, I mean, you're a funny guy, but you have a very serious side to you. So how have you been able to marry the two where you're not doing stand-up comedy, but in your films, you tend to do comedic kind of movies? Mm, naturally, since I was born, I've always been a happy person inside like within my family or my close friends, right? But when I step out of the door, it's, I know that the serious side comes out. But the people that really, really know me, know me that I'm a joker, I'm, one of, I'm, I'm you know, easy to get along with, that I'm, I'm the fufu guy, you know, I, I'm always chilled out. So when I create those things, that's when I'm within that environment, my family environment or my friends' environment, not when I'm, you know, when I'm mingling with the world. So when I'm by myself, the real Pascal is the one, is the one you see in the film. In the films. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the real Pascal in your Hurricane in the Rose Garden. That was a really nice uh, film. Tell us about the budget and what went into producing it, because a lot of filmmakers want to know those details on what it takes to produce a film like that and the whole story, pro story writing process. Mm, Hurricane in the Rose Garden, I wrote Hurricane in the Rose Garden in 2005. Um, when I finished writing it, I felt that I've given it uh, the African man sense. But I, w I wasn't shooting it for the African market, I was shooting it for the US market. So, a uh, universal market. So, what I did was I hired uh, an American. The guy's name is Kamafi. I said, Kamafi. I've already finished writing this script. I wrote it from the African man sense. Can you go through it with your American man sense and make sure that you, the English, the structure, uh, the the humor is something that will make your like, attention of your people? So he took he took it back a month and he brought the back the script and said we're good to go. So if you look at that script, it says written by by Pascal and Kamafi, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's how we did that script. And then after that script, I wasn't comfortable uh, directing it. I wasn't very comfortable directing it because then the movie I directed was all African movie and my American know. So I was wondering, wow, do I have enough experience to direct the American actors, especially the professionals like Tanji Miller, right? Aluma Wright, Akeem, you know, who have played at the highest level. So what I did was I, said, I went in and I found a Nigerian that was born in America here by Nigerian parents. Yeah, the they acquired them guy, right? Ime or something? Etuk. Etuk, yeah. Ime Etuk, right? Uh, Ime is very well trained. He's be very well experienced. So I said, bro, you know what? Ime didn't know he was going to direct that film. He thought he was going to be my assistant director. Because he was my assistant director in American Boss. So I told him, I said, bro, no, 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 no. You're not assisting me in this one. I want you to direct this one because we're shooting this for the American market. You have the Nigerian blood. Now you have the American side. You are the best to direct this film. He did it. It was about 3 a.m. in the morning that I made the call. So I told him, Can you do it? He said, Yes. So I, uh, I had him direct the film, and you can see he did a fantastic job. For people who don't understand the significance of that, can you explain it? Because it's not typical that you have someone like Ime. Yes, he's done a lot of work, but didn't really have director credits on his um, CV. So could you explain the significance of asking someone on that level to, to step up to the director level? If you look at Emes credits, if you go on IMDb and look at Emes credits, right, you can tell that he's had enough experience to be a director. The only reason why he hasn't directed as at that time is because there was no Nigerian making the calls. There was nobody that he knows who was at the head making the calls. Do you understand what I'm saying? Which comes down to what we discussed earlier on, the chain of power, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. I'm, a, I'm on the same page with you. So had they been, he may have been in a situation whereby there were Africans controlling in power, there were Africans calling the shot, he would have directed a long time ago. 
That's or true. Stopped. That's true. Although sometimes I think in film that's true, but sometimes outside of film, we tend to go find everybody else but somebody who looks like us to direct. But I do agree um, because Nollywood is in a lane of its own, and and that truly does make sense. It's like the B Bandeli guy that did half of the Yellow Sun, for example. So yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, and considering the cultural the cultural attachment to the story, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. right? Story to Caucasian to direct, he wouldn't do a good job with that. He would only know the technical side of it, but he wouldn't understand the cultural part of the story and what I'm trying, the story I'm trying to tell. Exactly, exactly. Him with African parents born in America, lived with them. He knows our culture. Yes, yes. And he knows American culture too. See yeah. what I'm saying? So yeah. Was the best person. He was the best person to do that. I don't think anybody else would have done a better job with that film, yes. honestly. Yes, yes, yes. He did. He he definitely did a good job. So before I get into your latest movie, um, drop a few pieces of advice to our filmmakers, our AML filmmakers listening to this, on how to get their work distributed. Um, I know that a lot of people don't like to share information, but I don't believe that. I believe that we do, as a people, should be sharing our resources and working with each other and training the next upcoming young minds because then, you know, that's how we really progress. And they come to us, too, because they know that we are willing to share. And then they bring their businesses or solicit us for, you know, roles like directing and other things for their films. So for people who have created their films, um, for people who have created their films, you keep hearing this stuff, even back the entire Nollywood industry about how tough it is to get distribution. But here you are doing it over and over again. So clearly it must not be that tough. So what are we missing here? How do you get your movies distributed if you don't mind sharing at least tips that, that they can make that um, happen? It starts from the kitchen, the cooking. Before you have to dis- you have to find out what is it that the distribution companies are acquiring, what are they buying, so that when you go into the kitchen to cook, if they are buying beans, don't go and cook rice because they will not buy rice. You cannot afford them to buy rice. If they la- if they like to eat a- eat a goosey soup, don't go and cook okra soup because you will end up eating it with only you and your people. So the thing is. For you to do a movie and the universal market is your target, right? There must be some elements in that script that can accommodate the universal market, number one. Number two, the technical part of it. Just because you know how to handle a camera doesn't make you a director of photography. Uh, photography. You know what I'm saying? Just because you know how to turn a sound machine doesn't make you a sound engineer. Just because you, you, you know how to... Uh, chop up a film doesn't make you an editor. You have to come up technically, get trained, let them get trained. Then when you get trained and you cook the food, you, you, you do your research and find out this is an African story. I'll give you an example, uh, The Trace. You remember my movie, The Trace? Yes, yes, yes. The Trace is a movie that was written by four African boys, right? They sent it to me to produce it. They wanted it for the U.S. market. I told them straight up, this right here, it's not going to go into the U.S. US market, even if you use the, the best technical people in the world. They asked me why. I said it's not structured for the U.S. market. But if you guys want us to do it for the U.S. market, we need to do it right. But it's not going to be by you guys. So I need to hire people to rewrite the script with me. So what I did was I hired one Caucasian guy, American. One African-American, right? Black, right? Then I hired one Chinese boy and myself. And it took us three weeks to write the trace. That's why you saw Billy D. Williams in it. That's why you saw Lynn Whitfield in it. That's why you saw Brian Hooks, Chuck, uh, uh, Chico Benimon, and all of them inside our film. Because we cook what the actors want to eat. If the actors, American actors want to eat it, that means their distribution companies is going to eat it. So mm. you, don't, you don't go and cook whatever you feel like and bring it to them to eat. It's not going to happen. It's never going to happen. That's why it's good, my sister, for them to come in here and get trained. Who do you have directed 500 films in Nigeria? Who do you have made 1 million films in Nigeria? You want to step out of your comfort zone in Nigeria. Then you need to be able to stand with one feet and run. You need to come and run the game first. Then after you learn the game, you come and play. Then they will buy it. You don't just come out from nowhere because you have access to money. You say, I'm, I'm about to go do a movie in Hollywood. I have 5 million, 10 million. You're just going to lose it. I'm not 
some names. Most of those film, films you mentioned before, that what they spend 200, 500 million and all that. If you give me 500 US thousand dollars, I'll produce it and I will sell it. Better quality. Same cast. Same mm -hmm. story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And why, why is that? Because you know what goes back to what you said. You know what people want to eat. You're cooking exactly what they want. And, you, and because of that, there's a demand for your food. And you're able to sell that food. And yeah. the distributors are saying, hey, Biko, there are a lot of people stay pleased. There are a lot of people waiting in line around the block for that food because they like your mama puts kind of food, basically. Yes, yes. You, you, my sister, they are, they are, so they, that's the problem with distribution. They're not, they not going to get the distribution. They won't get it until they get ready to come in here and learn. There's a guy now in New York. You know Stella Damascus? Of course, of course. And she's with uh, Daniel, right? You know Daniel? Yeah. Daniel, Daniel I don't know them personally, but I, I know of them. Mm -hmm. Like Daniel now. Daniel has made movies in Nigeria, very successful films, but he realized I cannot break into these people if I don't come and study how they cook their own food. So Daniel has been in New York studying, studying, understanding the American film, American story style of telling, right? What do they want? How do you do this? And he keeps asking questions. I can assure you, when he steps out, he's, he's going to get distribution. Because now he's doing what, what is required to be done. Okay. Come study first. Okay. Mm. You, you, uh, let me just ask you one question before, again, we get to the LAPD uh, African Cops. You talked about how you, take the, you took the film, for example, for the trace, the script, and then you had four writers, yourself included, all diverse, restructure for the American market. What are one or two ingredients that go into the restructuring, the storytelling? What is it that um, the American audience wants that requires you to restructure even some of the other movies you've done in the past where you had, you had your director restructure that movie for the American audience? Okay, I'm going to answer it very simply with you over this scenario. What makes an African African laugh? Might not make an American laugh. Yes, yes. Now, if you want to make a universal movie now, right, you need to bring professionals, comedy professionals, two from, let's say one from Africa, one from America, right, African American, one Caucasian, bring three of them together. They will take that one thing that makes the African laugh. They will work on it, work on it until you can make all three laugh. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. That's what the restructuring is. Okay. Right? Because now I'm there representing the African side. Bill Brown is representing the African American side. Right? David is representing the Caucasian side. And we have Chai representing the, the Chinese side. So we're going to, I you know, when we wrote this trace, we started from page one. You, you read the story, you understood the story, I read the story, you read the story. You said, okay, let's take this story from page one. That's how it happened. You see what I'm saying? Yes, so, yes, yes. Yeah. So the final business of film question for you, and mm -hmm. then um, I'd like to get some tips or advice generally to our audience listening in general before we say goodbye. Uh, and that question is your LAPD African cops. You just dropped a trailer, very, very cool trailer, funny. Your films mm, yeah. just tend to be funny. I, I love watching them because it just makes you laugh while you say, oh, I resonate with that. Oh, I've thought about that gazillion times tell us a little bit more about the movie and why you decided to create it mm, i decided to create lap the african cops because you know coming from the african uh, background right that's a lot of things i see the, in america that is wrong but to them because of their culture it's not wrong so if i go out here now and say hey this is you guys are doing this wrong this is wrong this is not how it's supposed to be done they, they, they will not listen to me but if i come up with who has power in America? Who, who controls the community in America? The police, right? They use the police to regulate most of their things in the U.S. I said, okay, the best thing is to write as a police officer. And then we are that power of police officer. And usually I'm going to the streets and say, this is wrong, this is wrong, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. But coming from the African side, using African culture to judge their streets. Mm, mm, mm. Very funny. I can't wait to, uh, to watch it. When is it going to be released officially and where will people be able to go uh, purchase uh, uh, they will, watch they will, it? They will get it from Walmart, Redbox, Netflix, Target. Um, that's no longer Blockbuster. Anywhere the American films are sold is going to be there. 
including online also. Well, including, Netflix, yeah, yeah. Netflix, Netflix, yeah, Netflix, yeah, uh, Hulu. So we, we we have a couple of distribution companies that we work with. So we, we have what is called a first look deal. Yes. With a company. So but go ahead and explain the first look deal for people who may not understand. Okay, first look deal is the, like now we have a deal now with Van Hose, right? For the trace, it's releasing the trace. By the way, it's coming out January, February, Black History Month. Okay, so great. During, this month, uh, 2015, we're going to have the trace out there. So it's going to be in Walmart, Netflix, everywhere. You, you can get your film cinema. But you're going to get that. So what a first look deal is, is I have a first look deal now with Banos and Cinedine, right? Holy as is with Lionsgate. When I finish a film, like the trailer came out last night, right? I cannot send that film to any other distribution company. I have to send it to them first. If they don't like it, that's when I'm then free to shop it somewhere else. Yeah. The whole idea of the right of first refusal, same, same concept of first yeah. look. We get the yeah. chance to be the one to first refuse yes. this. And then if we don't like it, we go somewhere else. Otherwise, if we like it, then we negotiate the deal terms. And that's what Pascal is talking about for everyone listening out there. Yeah, that's what it's called. The first. So we have a first look deal now with Van Hose. So by God's grace, by next week, uh, I'll put the finishing touches and send it to them. And I know by God's grace they're gonna like it. Okay. They like yeah, because they like comedy and they approved the script before I shot it. Oh, nice! And that's a big one too um, for filmmakers to get that approval first. Almost like on the on the writing end of things, you want to have some pages ahead of time approved because then you know that there's a market for it when you're creating. Yes, yes, and you have to know your target audience before you write. Who are you cooking the food for? Yeah. If you're cooking it for a Caucasian, don't put a lot of pepper in it. If you're cooking for the African, put pepper in it. The yeah. same thing, same the same system of cooking food is mm -hmm. what you do with thing. You have to know who you're cooking for, who is your guest, who's coming over. Yeah. Hey, you know what, Pascal? Just before we get tips from you generally um, about um, about the business of film and any advice you want to leave for our audience. How has the whole VOD, uh, video on demand, and just, the, you talked about there's no longer Blockbuster, but before, you know, I went to Blockbuster and got your movie when I wanted to watch it, Hurricane in the Rose Garden. So how has that affected you, or has it affected you as the filmmaker? Or you just turn that over and let the distributor worry about that? It's, it's advanc advancements of technology. We have to embrace technology in every field, whatever field you are in. Uh, if you're a medical doctor, equipments change every day, right? It doesn't mean that that particular stack of sickness is not going to be cured. So that's the same thing with DVD. Now, DVD is dying. It's actually dying, dying, dying. And they came out with video, even iTunes. You know iTunes not carry movies too, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. So Amazon, iTunes, a bunch of them. There's so many yeah. out there. So if, if one is dying, there's already one in place to take over. So you do understand? So it's just a, 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 a transition period. We are transiting from DVD now to VOD, uh, iTunes, uh, Netflix online, and all that stuff. So it, it, it really, it's not a really big deal. The only thing is just the, the, the stress of the transition. So the distribution companies, that's their business. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because yes. they, they control this game. They control this game, which is what we are. I'm going to advise any African out there with some real money to, to let's find a way to own our own distribution company in America. Yeah, because right. once we own our own distribution company in America and then we've started how they cook the food, we can cook a lot of food. <laughs> and I, I think that Nollywood in future, I mean, you've seen what's happened with Bollywood. I really do believe that Nollywood can be a major threat because we are not following the rules of the game. And we've been able to do so much. So when we start learning and even, you know, modifying our own uh, system to better talk to the world and share stories that resonate with a lot of people uh, globally, I think we, we would even be more formidable than we already are. So, Pascal, leave us with a few pieces of advice from your wealth of knowledge and experience. I mean, you've, you've, you've gone through it all and you've talked to us from the very beginning of the struggle the hunger that you had back then the hunger you still have for success and continued success and stepping this game up 
you're opening doors for so many people in Hollywood. You need to be commended because most people have not opened the kind of doors you have and will stay in that Hollywood for like forever and they can't even make things happen. You have consistently and it's the passion and the drive because somebody said your accent was not good enough. And yeah. you said, no, you don't get to define my accent or who I am. And I'm not going to change it or be, what do they call it, funny? Yeah, funny or fake. Exactly. This is who I am. So um, leave people, all my listeners, everyone listening, African Music Law audience, with two, three pieces of advice uh, on, on filmmaking and just life in general and how they should approach things and when obstacles come their way. Um, um, stick your eyes on the prize. Follow your dreams. And remember what uh, Lupita said. Everyone's dream is valid. Mm, very good. Very good. Thank you so much, my brother. It's always good to talk to you. You know, we can go on and on forever. So I knew I've been chasing you for a long time. I said, Pascal, <laughs> I think it's been over a year. I said, Pascal, we have to do an interview. We have to do an interview. And I'm so glad that I uh, moved forward with the podcast show because it gave me the opportunity to talk to someone like you. There's so much that you have to share. And I think a lot of people need to hear it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm humbled and honored, and uh, we can do it anytime. Thank anytime. you. Anytime. Please come yeah. back and tell us the progress <laughs> and anything you want to share. I'm always open to having you on the show. You have so much to share. We didn't even touch that much. There's so much more, but we only have, what, not more than an hour to try to, or 45 minutes to an hour to try to get a show in. But in future, absolutely. I'll come hunt you down again. Yeah, and please let them know that we have our trace. The trace is coming out. January, February, okay. Black History Month. Please go and buy it so that they can keep buying my movies. And Please. they can get it on Netflix. They can get, they can get it on Netflix, Walmart, Target, VOD, any VOD TV stations. It's gonna be there. For a couple of them will make any deals. Okay, so it's and, gonna uh, stream. It's gonna stream online. Uh, it, it will be on iTunes also. Yes, we'll be everywhere the Americans have their movies. We're going to have the movie there. Okay, sounds good. Make yeah. sure to send the releases and stuff too so I can share with our audience. All right, thank you very much, sister. God bless you and thank you for having me. No problem. Enjoy the rest of your day. All right, God bless. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. AML people, you heard the man himself. He provided a lot of tips and also practical applications, especially for those of you looking to take your product offering, your content offering to the U.S. market and beyond and have it distributed everywhere. So think about those possibilities and think about the options available. It's not always just book stuff. And I'm talking about just a lot of people have come through my door on, on, on the legal side, on the firm side of things. And there's a lot of non-actual practical application, lots of theories, lots of throwing money at things and not really resolving situations. So you've heard from someone who's doing it, go out there and think more strategically and apply, 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 and put in the work, train yourselves, gain the skill sets he's talking about, learn what's necessary, both on the African continent and especially on the US and Western end of things, if you're looking to try to penetrate this market, and it can be done. It's not any magic. It's not anything whatever. It's not anything special. What's required is that we all work together. We all combine our brain power and resources and networks. As Africans, I don't buy the theory that we're just too horrible or too bad to work with each other and that we need to always go out first and have outsiders before we think to validate us before we believe that we can actually accomplish what we set up to so hopefully pascal has shed a lot of light and dropped a lot of insights which i know he did today and that will serve you all very well until next time i will talk to you all soon be sure to subscribe on the website directly www.africamusiclaw.com to stay updated on when we publish it's got the itunes stitcher Hulk share and all this other buttons that you can easily just uh, click from the website directly to subscribe to all these other options that are available or you can directly find our show the Africa Music Law dot com show with Miss Uruak on iTunes and Stitcher. Until next time I'll catch you guys. Um, have a great week ahead. Stay blessed. Keep your head up and cheers people. <laughs>